in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8. Jeremiah 8. And let us look at verse number 20. Jeremiah 8 and verse number 20. Do you see that? It says, Thank you, precious Holy Ghost. Now, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. The harvest came, but it's gone. The summer came and it's gone, but there is no result. This verse of scripture speaks really about the life of many Christian believers. If not most Christian believers all over the world. This teaching has no cultural relevance. It's a universal revelation. Are you still here? The teaching on the breaking of the bondage of soul tie has no cultural uh, you know, relevance in the sense that it is not a cultural contest. It's not a cultural message. It is for the body of Christ. Everyone that is a human being, everyone that is born again, you need to understand this reality. Now we see in this verse of scripture, it says, the harvest came and the summer came, but there is no harvest, there is no result. So we have to ask ourselves this question, why is there no result? Why did the harvest come and the summer is gone and there is no harvest? There is no result. There must be a reason. That's right. There must be a reason. Now, please, listen to this. Not all churches are the same. Amen. We must understand this. Amen. And I, I know I've taught you on this in the pulpit. I want to re-emphasize it so that we, we keep getting reminded of these realities. All churches are not the same. All ministers are not the same. The truth is that right now, there are ministers who are at the level of elementary school. They are elementary school ministers. That is their level. Their teaching, their understanding of scriptures is at the elementary school level. There are preachers who are at the secondary or higher school level. Their teachings will be relevant to their level of understanding their level of revelation. And there are teachers or preachers or pastors or ministers whose level is at a university. Their revelation, their insight, their presentation will be at that level. But even then, that is the bachelor's level. Then we also have what we call the master's level and the doctorate level. And even in other instances, multiple doctorate levels. So not all preachers are the same. Not all teachers are the same. Not all churches and pastors are the same. So if you have grown up or you were part of an elementary school church and you come to a ministry like Faith Factor Ministries and you hear us teach things like this, you say, is this in the Bible? Is this crazy? No. You have just been promoted by God. Because there are things you need to know that will orchestrate your blessing, your manifestation in life. If you don't know those things, then you don't know those things. And you can never make it in life. Are you following me now? And so when you come to a ministry like this, you get ready for insight. Get ready for revelation. Get ready not just for, you know, uh, platonic teachings, but deep teachings. Of scriptures. I am like a surgeon. That is my ministry philosophy and concept. I don't give uh, Advil or Tylenol to, you know, suppress the pain. No. We go right into it to remove the root of the problem. That is the way we operate. So if you are used to receiving Advil, and you come, we say, look, we're going to put you on the table now to open up your spirit and your soul and remove from you what ought not to be there. Yes. You may have some pain. You may not even understand it from the very beginning. But when you get up from the table, you are blessed forever. 
That is our ministry philosophy. Because every one of us here today, we were, let me say this way, 30 different people contributed to our natural birth. 30 different people. Your ancestors. 30 different people contributed. There's something in you that came from people before you. 30 of them. Seven. Luke 1 from 67. Are you there? Now his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, what does this mean? From that very verse of scripture, we now understand it was the Holy Spirit speaking. This is about John the Baptist. Now his father, Zechariah, was, was a prophet. And then, not just being a prophet, he was filled with the Holy Ghost at that instant. And then he began to prophesy. Now, what does that mean? That means whatever he said from that moment was not his thought, but the thought of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it was the Holy Ghost that was speaking through him. So let us hear what the Holy Spirit said. And in verse 68, the Holy Spirit is speaking now. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Verse, verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies. Do you see that? So what is the plan of God? We should be saved from our enemies. Not only that, and from the hand of all who hate us. My emphasis now 74, to grant to us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. We can see a clear manifesto, the plan of God. We are to be saved from our enemies and those who hate us, and then we should be delivered. When we are delivered, we are able to worship God in holiness, in righteousness, without fear, all the days of our lives. That is the plan of God. That is the sequence. We get born again, and then we get ministered to, so that covenants, soul ties, bloodline issues are taken care of. Then we are able to serve God in holiness. Listen to this now. When a negative voice is speaking in our bloodline, how can we serve God in holiness? When a negative voice is speaking in our bloodline, how can we, how can we serve God without fear? Are you following me now? So see, 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 the great challenge of the body of Christ is that we have ignored this sequence. We, we can skip this. If you skip it at the earlier stage, you will fight it in the future. And that is the reason you find many of us going to church, serving God 10 years, 20 years, for even 40 years, according to Pastor Martina, and nothing seems to be working. Why is it not working? There is a voice speaking in the bloodline. There is a soul tile that was not severed. There is a blood covenant working against you. But you want to serve God in holiness. So it becomes a roller coaster experience. Faith rises and goes down. You are inflated and deflated. You come to church, you are inflated. You leave church, you are deflated. Why? Because something within, a covenant that is speaking, a soul tie that is operational, is resisting your manifestation. Is somebody here today? Are you ready for this? Yeah. I believe the scriptures. I believe the word of God. God is not a liar. Everything he says, he means. So if God has made the promise, why is it not manifesting in your life? Why somebody or some other people, you see them enjoying these promises, but you are not having the same experience. Something must be wrong. And not with the word of God. Not even with your belief. Because you truly believe. But there is a resistance somewhere. Something kicking against your actualization. This is what this is about. So it takes a spiritual surgery. To deal with that. Nine ways to feel happy can solve this. 
Jesus is Lord. What is a soul tie? A soul tie practically is a knitting together, a clinging together of a person's soul to another person, place, or thing. The knitting together, the clinging together of a person's soul to another person, place, or thing. There are different kinds of soul ties. There is a blood soul tie. There is a concept soul tie. And of course, we have a religious soul tie. These are some of the soul ties that are in existence. But I really want to deal with some of it because we are talking to in a church environment right now. What really pertains or what may be, you know, uh, uh, dominant within the church context. That is really what I want to look at. Now, first of all, the scriptures cannot be broken. Are you with me now? Jesus said he didn't come to abolish, but he came to fulfill. So the New Testament, therefore, does not abolish the scriptures or the promises of the old or the statements of the old. Now, it's so tight. They're knitting together. They're coming together. They're clinging together of a person's soul to a place, person, or thing. I give you some class, some examples. Years ago, Jesus is Lord. I met people who had never left the bushes of Africa, but who were acting like Michael Jackson. I don't hate Michael Jackson, great person, he had great talent. They never met him. They never, they only saw him maybe on television or listen to his music. They dressed like him. They wore suits like him. Well, white gloves and white shoes and black socks. All kinds of things like that. They even did their hair like him. They used makeup like him. They sounded like him. They danced like him. They talked like him. But they never met him. But they wanted to become like him. And before they knew it, they began to act like him. Without having met him. Are you following me now? That is a soul tie. They entered into a concept soul tie, a philosophical soul tie with him. He didn't even know they existed. But something in him clinged with something in them, and they became one and the same without knowing, except they didn't have money like him. Are you getting the picture now? Concept so tight. So you can look at something and develop an unhealthy interest with that particular thing, which is called obsession. And you become one with that thing without even knowing. Now, what is the danger of this area of so tight I'm talking about? Because it becomes a covenant. And the covenant basically means you have become one with that thing, one with that person. Which practically means whatever is relevant or prevailing in the life of that individual has access into your very life. And you begin to act the same way. If the person is sick, you're sick too. The person dies, then you lose direction in life. Because your direction was coming from him. Whatever he did was your direction. Whatever he said was your direction. When the person goes, you are lost. You may eventually even die, but the person is lost at that moment because the source of direction is gone. So tie. If it is an unhealthy relationship, it goes into becoming a negative so tie. If it's the wrong person, a wrong place, then it becomes that. Are you getting the picture? Okay, let, let, let's look at certain verse of scripture now. Psalm 68 and verse, sorry, 63 and verse number 8. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. What is the implication of that statement of scripture? 
whatever or whoever your soul follows affects your life. My soul follows closely behind you. And because of that, your right hand upholds me. Are you getting the picture now? Because my soul follows after you, my soul is knitted together with you, my soul has clinged to you. Because of that, the consequence of that, your right hand upholds me. Now, the, the psalmist is talking, we're talking about God here. But what is the implication? Anything and anyone that your soul clings to will affect you, will influence you. And I influence you positively or influence you negatively. Are you getting the picture now? My soul clings, my soul, sorry, my soul follows closely. So I'm connected in my soulish realm with you. Because of that, you are upholding me. Are you still here? Catch the revelation there now. So the question that comes now is this. What is it that you have clinged to? And who is it that you have clinged to? Have you clinged to your past? In the book of James 1.7, it says, A double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. But he goes ahead and says, Let not that person think that he will receive anything from the Lord. What is it to be double-minded? To be double-minded means you, are, you have a divided soul. Disjointed soul. Divided. So you can therefore learn from that reference that when there is a division in your soul, even your faith life, at best, will produce at a minimum level. He said, let not that person think it will obtain anything. So you can see the dangers of a negative soul tie. Are you see here now? You can see the danger of a negative soul tie. I want to begin to give some instances so that you can examine this with yourself, you know, in, in, in your own life. How is a soul tie established? I've already shown, shown us through marriage. Now, for people, listen to this now. This is very raw. For people who are maybe on your second marriage, it's as simple even up to the third and fourth marriage. I met a woman some years ago, and she was happy. She was married for five times. She was telling me about it. And I said to myself, there are people who have not even had the first opportunity. And so for those who have, you know, gone into second or third marriages, whatever the case is now, listen carefully now. This is the truth. Except there is a unique ministry, a unique ministration to break that. Your soul has been divided among the individuals that you have a relationship with. And for individuals as well who have had multiple partners, whether pre-marriage or whatever it is, you have entered into soul ties with those individuals. How do you enter into soul ties? You enter into a blood soul tie. Because according to the Bible, the semen that is exchanged during intercourse is blood. Science actually says that it is blood too. Science is trying to catch up with the Bible now. And that means it's an exchange of blood, which is basically a blood covenant. That means you have become a covenant, means you have become one with that person. Now, let's look at a situation where, in the case of that woman I was just talking about, Let's assume that she never had any premarital relationship, only just those five men. So she exchanged blood with five different people. So her soul has been divided into five different places for five different people. What kind of stability would that person have in life? It would be very difficult to become stable. In Psalm 86 and verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Do you see that? It says, unite my heart. In other words, make my heart and you to become one. And when it is one, I will fear you. In other words, let me have a soul tie with your name. 
then I will fear you. But what is the implication? It means also that it is possible for the heart to be divided. It is possible to have a divided heart. If he says, make my heart one with you, then it is possible for it to be divided. And a man praying like this must have experienced a division of heart. And is seeking God for restoration. Look at Acts chapter 15. Acts 15 and verse 24. Since we have heard that some who went from us have troubled you with words. Unsettling your souls. Saying you must be circumcised and keep the law. To whom we gave no such commandment. What does it mean? He said you heard words that unsettled your soul. That divided your soul. So the words you speak, the words you hear could divide you, could lead to a soul tie, could unsettle you and bring division in your soul. Acts 15, 24. Could bring division in your soul. And when these ties are in operation, they have one goal. A negative one for that matter. It is to frustrate a person's destiny. It is to frustrate a person's life. And that is the reason I've been doing this now for so many years. I have all kinds of uh, experiences with it. I've counseled with, uh, and, uh, I mean, numberless people, couples and all that. I've had people tell me, now this may, may sound strange, but this is the truth. People that are married, even in, during their marriage, they have to fantasize a relationship with somebody else while they are with their spouse. In their mind's eye, they are having a relationship with somebody else while they are with this one. You know why? It is an unbroken soul tie. That is the reason. An unbroken soul tie. And nothing breaks marriages like an unbroken soul tie. Nothing breaks marriages like an unbroken soul tie. Years ago, I ministered to a particular uh, person he had a force and came all the way from Toronto to see me here, married, Pentecostal church. He goes to Pentecostal church in Toronto, doing well, a businessman, loved his wife so much. The wife works too. One day she went on lunch break, and somehow, somehow, in the restaurant, she, found, she met a man she had a relationship with before, years ago, before she got married. And she is the music leader of their church. One thing led to the other, and she slept with that man. And then she became pregnant. And then she moved from her home to that man, to live with the man. And the husband pleaded and begged with her, I will have forgiven you. Don't even repent, I forgive you. We can keep this secret, the child will be ours. She still said no. She wanted to be with that man. And the man she wanted to be with was more or less like a good-for-nothing person. How would you leave your decent home and your husband and your family and go to somebody who has nothing positive, to con- not even money to contribute to your life? You know why? Because the soul tie was not broken, but she became a Christian and even leading worship at the church. And then somehow, yes, passed. She made his mother a restaurant and something happened because her soul was still well knitted to his soul over these years. So coming to church does not stop it. It has to be severed. And that was the problem with that relationship. But what are we trying to help you understand now? You can see how that is stayed in her soul for very many years. Her marriage didn't stop it. The birth of her children didn't stop it. The affluence of the husband didn't stop it. Even her ministry didn't stop it. This is the tragedy we find in Christianity today. Because people think that coming to church stops these things. Listen, it is not one size fits all. I've taught us before about this. Mind renewer is not a general thing. Mind renewer is on specific, unique things. 
The Bible talks about this book of Romans. It says we should renew our minds. That's very true. But how do you renew your mind? You renew your mind on philosophies, concepts of life, ideas. For example, your mind will be renewed by finances on how to flourish, on how to prosper. So you have a renewed mind in that area. And you have money flowing in and out of you every time. But the same man could be a wife bitter at home. You get him and beat up your wife. Wow. You just give a million dollars to a church on Sunday. You're not selfish. Your mind is renewed in that area. You're not afraid money will be finished or whatever the case is. You see money as a tool. So you use it very well. But the same man can get home and beat up his spouse. Why? Because their mind has not been renewed in that area. Now, you can see a person, they have a, their mind renewed about divine health and divine healing. They never fall sick. They were to be sick. They know how to believe God for healing, and they get healed. But that same person will never be able to release one dollar from their hands. So selfish that even a stamp is too expensive. By the authority of the Father, I am commanding right now, every spirit assigned to any covenant or so tie to any idol concepts religious spirits blood covenants contacts through marriage past sexual relationship or part relationships and partners listen to me by the authority of the father in the mighty name of Jesus Christ I command such so ties with anyone under the sound of my voice right now be broken be broken broken now I command you released. I command your souls released. I command your spirit released. I command everything that pertains to you in the plan of the Father released now. In the name of Jesus Christ. I decree now according to the word of the Lord. That your soul is fully, completely, totally restored back to you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Life. Go forth now and flourish in your life. Go forth now and prosper in your life. Go forth now and manifest the will of God for you. In the name of Jesus. Jesus.